Welcome, friends, to Everyday Insights, where I catch up with valued colleagues and share their life learnings so we can all learn to live a little happier. Today's guest is Nat Commissar, a friend with whom I share a close bond, even though we've spent very little time together. Stay tuned to learn about his successful run in the restaurant industry with Cincinnati's Maisonette, how music has been a thread through his entire life, how he fought his family's history of alcoholism to stay sober for the last 26 years, and the secret to his reinvention as a real estate agent, where he has found more success than at any other time in his career. If you enjoyed this content, leave a comment letting me know which part was most interesting to you. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And with that, let's dive right in. Well, hey, Nat, it's great to see you. Thanks for calling in. Likewise, Ian. Thank you for the invite. <laughs> yeah, I'm uh, trying to have people from all walks of my life, different times, different uh, careers, everything, get a little perspective from everybody on how their life has gone and what it's all meant. I wanted to start off with a little intro about who you are. Okay. So my name is Nat Commissar. I'm 64 years old, born and raised in Cincinnati, Ohio. I, you know, I have this thing. They tell you when you grow up and you're an adult, you're going to live within two miles of where you were a kid. And I swore I would never do that. And now I literally, I mean, it's almost like I could throw a stone and hit the house where I grew up. Man. That, set that aside. The statistics, I, <laughs> they, they yeah, matched exactly. up for you. So I um, uh, grew up in Cincinnati, then I did the, the circuit, uh, New York, Chicago, LA, came back here, was in the restaurant business for 33 years. That came to a screeching halt, and then I got into real estate and resort development and singing. Yeah. Still singing. Yeah. Yeah. Because we both went to Cornell and we were in a singing group there called Cayugas Waiters. Uh, yes, but I'm an old fart and you're not. Well, I don't know. That, that changes over time. I keep getting older, you know? <laughs> so you're, maybe you're when we changed. met, you're probably about my age now. So, so we met in 1999. Is that right? Yeah, I think That's so. The first year we came back as alumni to sing with that More Old Men group. Yeah. Which you guys named us More Old Men. We that did. wasn't us. Yeah. Well, that's good. It stuck, I guess. Wasn't that bad? It works. Yeah. For for you guys, it probably didn't make as much sense, or I can imagine feeling weird calling myself that now. But to the college kids, that was very very true. Hey, we were forty. We were old. <laughs> yeah, that was neat. You guys were our guest group for the show, and I really knocked the socks off everyone. I don't know how you guys got the practice together and put songs together. Like we're working all semester to do that stuff, and you guys were spread across the world, uh, and still were able to get that stuff together. So it was really impressive back in the day. It was a lot of fun. So I recorded um, learning tracks for those guys, uh, or Jonathan Wallach and I got together and recorded learning tracks. We shipped them all around. There were three or four rehearsals you know, all in New York, and you had to come knowing your music. And of course, no, it was the waiters. Nobody knew their music. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, oh, everybody grew up. It was like no, much better as adults. But no. Nothing had changed. Yeah. But we got through it, and by the time we got there, the enthusiasm was high enough that it was it was pretty killer concert. Yeah, everything always sounds better live too, or it seemed uh, seems really exciting. Then you, you go back and listen to the recording, at least on our the stuff the college kids did, and it's like, wow, but kind of missed a bunch of notes there, or that wasn't so good. Or, but it's a lot of fun being there. It's a lot of fun, is right. Yeah, yeah. So we'll maybe we'll talk some more about that, and then uh, yeah, I definitely want to hear about uh, your restaurant business. I never got to go or didn't know much about it back in the day, but I've gotten your emails and marketing for it for years. And it's interesting to me. I'd love to hear how you got into it and, and out of it uh, and how that kind of flow went. And then, yeah. And then hear about your current business stuff. It'd be pretty interesting too, how you switch careers. I think that'll be a, a fun story to hear of trying to do something totally new there. And it sounds like a, a bunch of different pieces to it. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's an understatement, but yeah, it, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a fun story to tell. Cool. You want to start off? I should off? mention along the way, I, yeah. I did help raise six children, so. Six? You have six kids? Yeah, four of mine and two of Bridget's. Oh, and, wow. And I got them early on, so I, I got six kids. Yeah, no, we'll definitely dig into how do you manage to do that. I, I just met a guy yesterday and he said, uh, he had just had a second kid and he was like, hey, don't do it. Don't do it. It's uh, having the second one. Uh, takes away all your time. I got, I got nothing, you know, <laughs> and another friend of mine uh, said, uh, one takes 95% of your time and the next one takes another 95%. So I don't know how you get to six. But, yeah. 
Well, once you go past three, it doesn't make any difference. It's just a swamp. Maybe it gets better. They start taking care of each other. Oh, <laughs> uh, there's a little bit of that. Yeah. 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 My wife's a baby of 10 and she talks about her older siblings parentally. So mm. Interesting. Yeah, it works that way. Yeah. Well, I'm too old to have that be my, my story, but, uh, but you know, it's still fun, fun to hear about. I'm sure there's a lot of people out there that uh, find it interesting. Um, so should we start off with the business stuff or where we want to start with college stuff? What do you feel like? Uh, Kyle, let's start, let's start with music stuff. Actually, that's much more interesting. Yeah. Cause for me, it started when I was five years old. My grandfather and grandmother were amateur performers. Although my grandfather was in a jazz band when he was in college at Wisconsin. And my grandmother went to university of Cincinnati and she was a flapper and a dancer and a singer. And so they raised my mom who then became the piano player and singer and guitar player and that sort of thing. And when I was five years old, she started teaching me parts to songs. As a matter of fact, the first thing she taught me was Angry by the Lemon Sisters. I mean, I can still remember it. Uh, and then we tried to incorporate my sister into it. And she could sing, but she didn't like it. So it was just me and my mom and then my grandfather. And then that led to a lifelong fulfillment through music. That's my church. I mean, that's... That's where I get grounded. When I was in high school, there was, I was a very small high school and there was no music program to speak of. It was nominal. So I started a choral group and we had eight guys and we, we, we founded a group and we, we even sang for graduation, uh, you know, that kind of stuff. And from then, scratch, huh? You started it from scratch. Just got together those dudes and yeah, got some songs. Just, you know, and, yeah. Do you like to sing? Do you like to sing? And it, it just kind of grew. And then, in college, I found the waiters and, you know, first thing my freshman year and got into the waiters. And as a sidebar, as a really small world department, when I was growing up, there were these four girls, the Casey sisters, and their dad was a guy named Jim Casey. And I'd always go over to their house and I'd end up sitting at the piano with Jim. And he'd have these big parties. He and his wife, Ann, would have these big parties where all these musicians would come over. And he's playing piano and it's like a Dixieland band in the background. And there's always marimbas and all this, this is instruments everywhere. And I leave the four very attractive young ladies and I'd end up at the piano with, with their dad <laughs> and I'd spend the entire night there. Turns out, unbeknownst to me, he went to Cornell. He was one of the guys who founded the waiters. Wow. And I had no idea. That is random. And you didn't find that out until way Not after. Until I got to Cornell. College. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And so, well, I got into the waiters and, and then uh, um, Dean Gowan was one of my era in the waiters and his dad, Gordy Gowan, um, was one of the founders. And so I met, and he, Dean lived in upstate New York and I met Gordy and he said, yeah, you're Cincinnati, you know, Jim Casey. And it's like, wait a minute, what? So. Wow. So how so many, I, I, I was gonna say, how many instruments did you learn to play uh, growing up or was that was it singing oh, a big part of it and just piano or what, what? Uh, guitar and piano and saxophone were the three things that I played. Yeah. Um, well, I would say guitar, piano, I dabbled saxophone, you know, let me be in the background. It's fine, but don't give me a solo, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I'll pick up anything and have fun with it just cause it's, it's just what I'm drawn to. Yeah. And did you learn a lot of music theory through that? Or was it more just like you learned to play a few I songs did. or how did that feel as a, yeah, as a kid? What's it's kind of innate. I took a few, I tried to take a music theory class at Cornell. I actually, I was at Cornell for six years. I changed colleges four times. Um, I didn't know back then that you couldn't transfer the credits. And after I'd done it once, it was like, oh, well, crap, now I'm done. I just, I'll just try whatever I want. So for a semester, I tried to be a music major at Cornell and music theory was so freaking hard. I thought there's no way I'm going to do this. And so I transferred again. Um, but wow. that's not us. So I digress. I, I, I um, it, it, music theory was not for me, but you know, do I understand enough of it to arrange music and to, you know, yeah, sure I do. Matter of fact, I started a group at Cornell, um, the touchstones, uh, there were a bunch of girls that wanted to sing. And I, you know, I said, sure, I can arrange music for you and start a group. And we did. Wow. Uh, and they're still there. The waiters aren't there, but the touchstones are there. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know that. I didn't know that connection. Yeah. The touchstones. Man, how did you do in school? How were your grades during this time? Or maybe because maybe that's why it took six years, too. <laughs> maybe the waiters no, no, and I, doing all this acapella stuff was, was pulling back for you. I was a poor student in high school because, um, and I was diagnosed later in life as being extraordinarily ADD. Mm. There's a scale of one to 40, and the test is a comprehensive. They test the individual and they test the people around him 
And if you score a 20 or above, you're likely attention deficit disorder. Hmm. I scored a 39. Yeah. Uh, and this was when I was in my 30s. So wow. when I was in high school, um, I could not at all focus on anything. And my grades were lousy. However, um, two things happened to me in, in my teens. When I was 14, I joined a barbershop chorus locally, which was really internationally known and had just won the world championship in 1973. And I joined in 74. And that was a incredible focusing moment. One of the things about ADD people is that when they kick into something, they get what's called a hyper focus mm. and it, we can achieve things that, you know, seem superhuman. I mean, you, you focus on something and suddenly you look up, it's four hours later and you did something monumental. Um, that was number one. Number two was, um, uh, I started drinking when I was 16, uh, 14 years old, I guess. And unbeknownst to me, um, we all know that drinking has a four hour depressive effect, but it also alcohol has a 13 hour stimulant effect hmm. and the medicine they give you for ADD is a stimulant. So, um, as a burgeoning alcoholic, I, um, I started drinking almost every night because my parents were the cool parents who had the refrigerator in the basement stocked with beer and the guy would come and replace it and refresh it once every three or four weeks. And, you know, my buddies and I, we had a constant supply downstairs. So um, my grades went from mediocre to bottom to I started drinking and I went to ninth in my class and graduated there. Wow. It actually uh, helped you. I got, oh, it helped me immensely. Mm -hmm. uh, I went into class and suddenly I was, instead of taking the average classes, I was in all AP classes and at the head of them, um, I got accepted to Cornell in October of my junior year. Uh, scored uh, double eight hundreds on my achievement tests when they were scored the same way as the SATs. Mm. So, so, you know, this marvelous little side effect uh, really kicked in. I, I mean, the converse happened as my drinking progressed. I went downhill rapidly, but it was a great start. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one. So yeah, watch out. Yeah, so, so I got to Cornell and I went to the hotel school and then uh, I said, this is my last chance to to read books and have conversations and well that's what i said but what i really wanted to do is i wanted to sing with the waiters for longer than just four years and so suddenly i'm there for six and um it was great i mean yeah. i had an absolute marvelous time that's awesome yeah that, yeah. that's kind of what i was referring to or i thought of this uh before our call that you know my grades seem to fluctuate a bunch with our spring concert or it correlates a lot. I don't think it, but mm -hmm. I, what I was trying to determine, is there a causation, right? I think, you know, I would do way worse when we were putting on spring fever, but I think it was more my attitude towards school and my, you know, not going to class, not focusing, not studying as hard than it was me spending. I definitely was spending more time with the waiters, but I don't think that was really stopping me from going to school. A I shift had, in focus, a shift in priorities. Yeah. I mean, what drives you, what's important to you. And for me at the time, it was singing with those guys. Yeah. It, it's such a, it's, it's an odd fraternal bond. You know what I'm talking about. It's not just like a fraternity. Uh, and I was in a fraternity and I still have some friends from that fraternity. You and I never actually sang together, but the bond you and I have is probably stronger than that I have with the guys in the fraternity house. Wow. That's weird. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's arrangements of music that I know. And if we got together and there was like 10 guys there, yeah. we'd be singing the same song right now. Yeah. You know, me and the boys, whatever it is, it's right now. Yeah. Cool idea. Powerful. That was one thing I wanted to ask you about is like, why you think that has transferred across all these years or why do you think you stayed interested in it and chose that as like, it was only a few years of our life in a way you've had many, many more experiences, decades of experiences after that. And yet there's still this touchstone or this place you've gone back to, to both re-strengthen those bonds, you know, sing with them again, connect with those guys, go on vacations with them, you know, make them a priority. Why do you think that is versus something else like, like your fraternity? Oh, there's a truth in music that doesn't exist in other realms. It just is. It's pure. And I'm, that sounds kind of campy and trite, but it's real. The sound that's made by a human voice in paired with another human voice or three or four and those overtones that are created 
it's just a rush. It's a sound orgasm. It's just something that once you've done it, it's like, wow, I'd like to have more of that. And the euphoric recall of who you did that with, it's a pretty powerful force. It, it's, and you know what? Mickey Rapkin um, kind of encapsulated it really well when he, when he, in, in Pitch Perfect in the movie, or it wasn't Mickey's script, of course, but, you know, the old guys that kept following around the new group, well, that was him poking fun, fun at us. At a universal concept, I think, a, more yeah, so than, exactly. than you guys directly, but. Yeah, the comedic version of it for sure. Well, the best part is he became one of us <laughs> after the fact. Yeah. Yeah, we all do. Yeah. Yep. What about the flip side of that? So I have a lot of good memories of going out and singing with guys or we, you know, we do stuff on campus. We do things in our, uh, in the garage after a night of drinking or, you know, we, we do different, some different public things. But every once in a while, there's been stories where we've run into trouble from some other group of dudes. Oh, you mean with other uh, other singing groups? No, more like bros. You know, more. <laughs> we're oh, gonna get in goodness. trouble with uh, with normies or non singers. No, I don't have any of those. Um, uh, there's plenty of funny stories. One time, everybody's in Florida, and we had gigs in Tampa and Orlando while we were in Florida. Uh, we kind of didn't realize that they were separated by several hours of highway. <laughs> So, um, everybody's got on white pants, yellow shirt, blue blazer, 12 guys. It wasn't the full group. 12 guys could make the trip. We're in two cars and we are speeding down the highway because we had gone to the wrong place, the wrong city to do the show. And we had, you know, we'd given ourselves a lead time. We're going to be late for the actual show, but we can make it. And so we are burning across the highway to get from Tampa to Orlando, two cars. The cop sees, you know, sees us coming and the lights come on and he's out there and he pulls over the lead car. Well, Andy Bigelow at the time was driving the trailing car. Uh, Steve Snyder was the guy in the front car. Steve's outside the car standing in that outfit. The car is full of guys in that outfit. Andy pulls up behind, gets out of the car, walks over to the cop and the cop turns to Andy and says, do you know this guy? And he says, I've never met him before, but I love the way he dresses. <laughs> and the cop just loses it right at that point and waves everybody on without a ticket. I mean, it's just perfect. And if you knew Andy, he's just perfectly deadpan. He never cracked a smile. It was just, yeah. I mean, we just have, I don't know. It's not that funny. That kind of story is not that funny to the outside world. But the fondness of that memory is just burned in my brain. Yeah, that's great. I think it's a funny story. I think anybody would laugh at that. We'll, we'll see, I guess. Leave a comment. Uh, leave a comment if you find this story funny or not. I got to remember to say this a bunch. I'm going to try to poke on people to engage more. Cool. What should we go to next? Well, uh, I continued music after college. Well, I, to, to a degree. I came home. I tried to sing with the chorus that I had joined earlier, but... Uh, well, take it back. When I said I came home, I came home briefly like three or four months to Cincinnati. And then I got a job. Is it after college, you mean? Fully after, after college. college? Yeah. Ended up in a uh, uh, run in the pump room in Chicago for Let Us Entertain You uh, in the restaurant business. And then I got a job uh, out in California in Orange County, running the food service for a brand new Doubletree Hotel next to the Crystal Cathedral and, the, uh, and Anaheim Stadium, Disney, that kind of stuff. So you started out in the um, hotel school, right? And then you ended up uh, as a major in like history or something, right? I finished with a history degree because I needed to get out of there. I yeah. had 168 credits. You only need 120 to graduate. I was actually four short of the actual degree requirements. And they just said, here, take your diploma and go. Get out of here. You're done. <laughs> <laughs> so then you went back and you're kind of in the hotel industry then. Because that's what the... my family did. So, yeah. you know, I knew I was heading that way. This is my going to be my last chance to do anything. So, mm. so I get out of college. I'm, I'm making the circuit and, um, uh, from an early age, I mean, I, uh, I learned a work ethic from, you know, I was 13 years old in the summer times I'm washing dishes and bussing tables. I mean, when you're in a restaurant family, you grow up knowing that you put the hours in, it's just what you do. Mm. Um, so I was successful doing that. And when I was out in California, my uncle came to me and said, it's time to come home, which I did. Um, and I came home having just married my first wife by eloping. 
that was a dysfunctional relationship, but it spawned four wonderful children. Mm. Um, I will never regret it because I learned a lot about myself. I was able to get sober during that period of time we were married. And I ended up at the end of it back in the restaurant business in Cincinnati. So I was out of college. I was gone for three, four years. I'm back in 85, 86. And by 1993, I'm running the show downtown, which is Maisonette upstairs, the fine dining fresh restaurant, and Lenormandy's a steakhouse beneath it. And Lenormandy had music. So I started booking music into Lenormandy because it hadn't been done for years. Mm. And let's call it 2000, 1999. Uh, I'm getting divorced. And two of my friends are Larry and Timmy Goshorn. And Larry and Timmy Goshorn were famous in the 70s and 80s, especially at Cornell, because they were two of the band members of Pure Prairie League. And they recorded a song called Amy, and you're shaking your head like... Yeah, don't, I don't know this one. <laughs> well, waiters sang Amy. Amy was the most played song on the radio for like 20 years. Uh, Amy, what you want to do? Uh, anyway, I forget it. Oh, the yeah, basic, yeah. I know that one, I think. Yep. So they said, you're not going to get Mopey on us. You're going to get your guitar out and start playing again. And I hadn't really played for 19 years. So I started playing every night with two guys from Pure Prairie League. And suddenly I'm having a blast again. I'm doing what I remembered. It kind of starts flooding back. And so I started buying guitars again. I, I only had one at the time. And um, now I've got a, a room with like 12 on the wall. Um, <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's more art, I think, than it is an actual musicianship. Yeah, but, yeah. It looks really cool. Fun to collect, for sure. Yeah, I'm playing and singing with those guys every night uh, until I closed the restaurants in 2005. And then along about 2012, there was a very famous, world-famous barbershop quartet. And the bass, one of the guys who taught me how to sing when I was a teenager, he died. Mm. And they called me and they said, could you take Jim's place? And it's like, wow, well, well that's, I'm honored and, you know, I'm excited. So I sang with the group called the Roaring Twenties for five years. Along the way, in 2017, I heard this group on a YouTube channel sing an Alicia Keys tune, and I thought, wow, they could really use a bass. And I just called them, and I said, I'm your next guy. And they said, okay, sure, why not? So <laughs> I started singing with a group called No Promises Vocal Band, and I still do. And then about two years ago, some guys came to me, and they said, would you like to form a quartet with us, uh, another barbershop quartet? We're going to compete internationally. And I'd never done that before. It's like, okay, sure. Why not? Yeah. That so, sounds really fun. So how many days yeah. a week are you meeting then with the different groups nowadays? Each group rehearses once a week and then occasional weekends, one of the groups is performing. Um, this coming week, I think we're actually going to a studio with no promises. We're going to record the Star Spangled Banner so we can start passing it out to uh, baseball and football and hockey teams and soccer teams and seeing if we can get a gig that way. Yeah. Nice. But yeah, it's the theme from the day I was born until today. I got to be singing somewhere, somehow. Yeah, that's great. What about yeah. the Star Spangled Banner? Uh, we, we did a rendition of that in the waiters and did yeah. it at, uh, at Homecoming one year when I was there. And it was like this kind of stupid, uh, difficult arrangement <laughs> that yeah. doesn't really play well in a through the bad PA system at, <laughs> at our stadium. But uh, yeah, how are you guys? choosing an arrangement oh we arranged it ourselves yeah. i mean one of the guys is a, a cincinnati college conservatory of music graduate and he's just this gifted musician josh Steele. most of what no promises sings is jazz as opposed to barbershop they're very different genres the the general public doesn't understand that there's a difference but the jazz guys don't like barbershop and the barbershop guys don't like jazz it's <laughs> really a, i'm in a comfortable middleman position at the moment <laughs> that you're just willing to sing yeah, exactly. It's not too funky, but it's got one passage where I'm singing in my normal register, and then I have to, from the land of the free, and on the word free, the chord shifts up, and I have to go to a B, two above middle C. It's quite a slide. <laughs> we'll see how it plays on a PA. It may be ear piercing I have yeah no idea. oh that's kind of what happened to us uh at homecoming too it just becomes a screech or maybe there's one person out of tune or you can't hear each other and then there's the echo and delay from speakers uh, yeah, yeah, that yeah, throws yeah. you off and uh yeah it just fell apart 
we had done some practicing with in the stadium with the PA system and it was like, it was pretty good. And then we did a lot of practicing, you know, separate from that, which sometimes sounded really great. Like the arrangement was complex and interesting and, but to really do it right for those things, sometimes simple might be the way to go. Did you arrange music? Uh, a little bit. I did a poor job with it. I did a couple songs, uh, one time with my girlfriend at the time and, uh, Help, who was a little who played piano and was a little more musical that way and, and helped me you know, figure out some of the notes. But I needed to practice more. I think that's the simplest way to say it. I so what was the tune? I did um, the the weirdest one that I think the, the rest of the waiters probably hate me for was I did Hotel California, and oh. and I tried to like mimic the the guitar, the you know kind of arpeggio or those just the the, the picking yeah. of the each chord that they do. Uh, with people's voices and the timing of it. And then, so I had each voice part having this insane weird rhythm. And the way I tried to teach them that was, it was like the early time in computers. So we plugged in all the notes to the computer and then I sp spit out a CD with each person's part, you know, going like, ba, 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 <laughs> like just this, uh, weird rhythm that happened to fall into, you know, and then when you put it all together, it kind of sounds like, the guitar strumming the different notes, but yeah, it was ambitious. That's the word. Ambitious. Yes, that's right. Yeah. It was, I, you know, it was experimental. You know, I tried to, I tried a new way of us all learning the music was cause we all learned by ear mostly anyway, people would read the music, but we mostly were just like having one person read it. And then the four guys would stand around and that were singing the same part. And we kind of all learned it by ear together. Um, so this was like a version that it's like, Hey, no one has to play the piano. Just put in the CD. You guys go off to your room and just sing along with the CD. And, yeah, didn't didn't quite work. But that's how but that's how we all learn parts now is somebody creates a MIDI from finale or or you know Sibelius Sibili or something and yeah. Yeah. So you were ahead of your time, that's all. I was trying, yes. Yes. Revolutionary. <laughs> how about you? What how many songs did you actually arrange um back in the waiters' days? So 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 if you talk to the guys from my era, they would tell you that I arranged music for one purpose only, and that was to give myself more solos. <laughs> so I would arrange two or three songs, four songs, five songs a year, whatever I felt like. Anything that had a low, vo you know, solo Oh, range. no, my voice was much higher, but I could okay. get up to an F or a G back then. Now I have a hard time getting over middle C. Um, but I could, I'd sing solos all day long, and I'd give the solos to somebody else once I was done with it. So after, you know, over six years, um, I arranged stuff as a freshman. I know that. So I would bet you uh, 30 songs. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Every bit of that. Yeah. I bet you got really proficient by the end there. <laughs> oh no, I don't know. It was, it was always sloppy and never proficient. And every now and then I'd realize actually singing it. It's like, Hey, th that's not a chord. That's just a first and a fifth and nothing else. It's just yeah. Gregorian, something very bizarre. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So in the fraternity, there were, I was a Sigma Chi and they didn't make pledge paddles per se, but you had a pledge project of some kind. And some guys would paint something if that's what they were proficient in, or somebody else would write an essay, uh, just something that would be indicative of what Sigma Chi meant to them. Mm -hmm. So I did a four part arrangement of the Sweetheart of Sigma Chi. And I think it's still hanging on the wall behind the piano in the fraternity house. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It's yeah, just, unique skill. And, and you do what you do. Yeah. Something goes forward for that way. Yeah. In uh, senior year, I took this class. Um, it was about atomic uh, weapons and atomic uh, energy and kind of like a history class in that regard of uh, how it all came to being and yada, yada, yada. And for the final project, the teacher was really interesting and cool. And he allowed us to just do anything. He said, do something related and just have uh, footnotes, you know, have cite your, your sources. Um, so anyway, I chose to play off of what we did in the waiters. I took, uh, I got, uh, Jason Langseth to, to come over and, uh, play guitar for me. And we did, uh, we didn't start the fire, we, you know, which, uh, the waiters would yeah. sing is we didn't go to Harvard. And then we, I changed the lyrics to that again, to, uh, be all about, cause the song is already partly has notes yep. in it from the atomic era. So it's just, yeah, all about nuclear war and the stuff we'd all learned in class. And it was awesome. It was like, you know, I got an A plus on it or something. I, I thought it, for me, it was seemed kind of easy where I was just like throwing a bunch of related words together in this format that we would do in the waiters, kind of used to changing the lyrics and songs. And uh, 
So it seemed kind of easy, but when I go back and listen to it, it's like, wow, this is actually pretty awesome. It actually encapsulates pretty, this class and like, and was a fun, fun little bit to do. So it's, it's neat when you, you get to use those together. You let it flow out of you. That's yeah. really marvelous. Yeah. So I was glad they appreciated it that way. But yeah, I haven't written too much music since then, I guess. Right? <laughs> that was the end of it. There's a future for you. You can find your way back in. That's right. Yeah, I think it's neat. I have a, a few other friends that have joined those kind of um, choirs or, you know, quartets or different kinds of you know, vocal bands as, as adults. Um, I have not tried to do that. I guess I had such mixed feelings about it sometimes. Of It was fun and I loved the relationships I'd make doing it. And I loved performing and, and all those pieces. But somehow it also felt uncool or un... Yeah, there was there was this negative element of getting made fun of for it sometimes that has scared me away, I, maybe as an adult. But one of the things I've often been reminded of, and I have it sitting over my desk at work, is someone else's opinion of me is none of my business. If I start focusing on what they think about me as opposed to what I think about me, I'm just going to derail. So I just go about my life and I do what I'm going to do. And as long as I feel, you know, square with the world, then I'm not really concerned that somebody thinks I'm a cornball because I still sing barbershop at 64 years old. I mean, tough. I mean, we went and, and competed in the seniors division in Daytona Beach this last January. And now, mind you, we probably had only had uh, five rehearsals. I actually, uh, they asked me to start in August. In September, I had a gallbladder attack, which I'd never had in my life. And nobody ever told me those things really hurt. I mean, it was terrible. Uh, so that, that had to come out. So I was out for a couple of weeks. Then one of the guys got COVID and he was out for a couple of weeks. So we really only had four or five rehearsals. We came in fourth in the world Wow! as seniors. Yeah. Go figure. Yeah. Yeah. So now we're engaged and we're doing it again. But we wore these green sequin jackets. I mean, they're God really awful. out there. Yes, <laughs> they're terrible. They're absolutely terrible. And, you know, fine. You can look at it and laugh all you want. So will I. But it was great. And people in the audience said, wow, you guys made quite an impression when you hit the stage. Yeah, I, that's one of the things I'm trying to bring out this podcast, too, is that, you know, you can have that internal perspective that you're hearing these feedback from the people and you change your own behavior because of it. But when I look out as an individual and I see you doing these things, or I see my other, all my other friends and colleagues, you know, having different accomplishments. I just see the success of it. And I see, wow, I'm, it's so amazing. They did that and dedicated themselves. Why not? It's great that you have some kind of focus and something you learned, something you tried to share with other people and bringing joy into the world. Like there's nothing negative about it. The, the thing I hope people come away with is when you see the success in other people, it feels good and you can obviously spot it. And then to remind yourself to search that out in yourself. It's almost as if when you look at somebody and you realize that they really don't care what you think, they are just sharing their joy. That's all there is to it. You can't help but smile. You can't help. You can, you can smile because you think they're cornball. But if you sit back and actually detach from your judgment and watch those people for a minute, you'll say, yeah, they're having fun. Good for them. And that's all it is. It's good for them. You know, we as human beings, we travel the world, and I used to have this thing I did where I took the notion of alcoholism to high school classes. And I'd talk to high schoolers about alcohol and, and what alcoholism looks like and how it manifests. And, and when I, I'd go around the room and I'd point to a kid and say, what do you think about all day long? And they'd say, oh, my grades, um, my homework, uh, what I'm going to have for dinner. And I'd go to somebody else, what do you think about all day long? And they said, uh, my favorite football team, and they'd all talk about themselves. And I'd point out to the group, we are human beings. 98% of what we think about is us. Everything that filters through us is about us. So if I say, you're ugly and your hair's blue, I'm not really talking about you. I'm talking about me <laughs> and my perceptions. So what in the world, why am I, am I giving any importance to those people out there and what they have to say about me because they're just talking about themselves. It's a message I hope more teenagers would hear. That's why I used to go to high schools and just spread the word. Preach. Yeah. Yeah. How'd you get involved with that? Or tell me a little bit about the alcoholism story maybe. And okay. So alcoholism is, is hereditary. It's uh, you can be an abusive drinker, but to 
to be an alcoholic is a you have to be a card carrying member. You have to belong to the club. <laughs> My dad uh, is was an alcoholic. Um, I bet you his dad was. The stories I heard of his dad were um, coming home from the restaurants at two in the morning with customers, turning on the lights in the backyard, playing badminton until four in the morning, taking a two hour nap, showering, going back to work again. Um, you know, it's pretty clear that it's passed down from generations. So, do you think that's a tough industry to be in to? have alcohol around all the time or you think uh, actually no really... um it was a great way to get sober um to have alcohol all around because i had a constant reminder of what was going on i could watch people around me d devolve through an evening and say yeah that's what i don't want to do <laughs> um you know changing beer kegs getting it slopped all over my hands and that kind of stuff it just it, it, it's instead of making it some awful distant taboo that i have to stay away from bars and booze it was around me every day i was in a bar i was serving booze and it would made it easy to get sober. Nice. In a weird way. Yeah. So my last drink was November 6, 1996. And it was a train wreck between, you know, the beginning and then. I only got pulled over for a DUI once. Why it was only once, I don't know, uh, because it should have been dozens of times. Uh, and I was losing my, my relationships at home, at work, my friends, singing friends. Everything was falling apart. And where at first started to get sober because other people were telling me that I was misbehaving and I was had a problem. I wanted to please them. I was thinking about what they thought of me hmm. as opposed to what I thought of me. And at some point along the way, that did shift to, I don't want to feel this way anymore. I don't want to worry about their opinion anymore. I don't want to, the phrase is sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. And I was. So it was pretty miraculous when it finally happened because I went to rehab in 1990 and I didn't drink for six months, but I was nowhere near sober. And then, um, actually, the funny thing is I went to rehab on November 6th of 1990 and I got sober on November 6th of 1996. I don't know why it's the same day, but it was. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I got sober and I don't think the rest of my life would have been manageable had it not been for the fact that I had, you know, started to put my life back together again. Did you have um, one of those traditional intervention moments or was it uh, your own kind of realization or how, how did that switch happen? I had individuals talk to me, you know, my, you know, my dad talked to me, but he drank just like I did. So that really didn't connect. My stepfather drank like I did. It, it didn't connect. I had a lot of people who were well-meaning. My ex-wife, you know, railed on me, but she was my drinking buddy. Matter of fact, when I got for, back from rehab and I was drinking six months later, she said to me, that's okay. I like you drinking better anyway. Well, there's a green light. <laughs> yeah. Not the support you need, I don't think. Yeah, but it was uh, in August or September of 1996 and my health was bad. I was overweight. I was smoking at the time. I just wasn't happy. I'm working in the restaurant business alone, but um, I had gotten a DUI that summer and the wheels were falling off the bus and I finally just gave up. And somehow I was given the grace to understand that I didn't have to anymore. And I still don't know quite where that comes from. Uh, it just, I've got plenty of friends who've tried it and they went back out drinking again and, you know. It's just uh, one of those things it's been, and now it's 26 and a half years since I had my last drink. So, you know, I think the lucky stars every day, but the rest of my life would have, would have just, I don't know that I'd be even be alive if I was still drinking. And what do I mean by that? I had a really emotional loss of my grandparents, uh, or I was still drinking when my grandparents passed, but, um, after I get sober, a few years later, uh, I got divorced. I mean, basically, my ex and I enmeshed when we were both dysfunctional and drinking. Mm -hmm. I was on a new path, and she didn't want to go with me. And so we went our separate ways. And we had four kids, and we had to figure out how to raise them, and we did. So I'm newly divorced, and then I meet a wonderful woman who eventually married me. Um, at the time she was just a friend, she was a neighbor and she had two kids the same age as my youngest two kids. And I thought, this is great. I can kind of get a pseudo babysit. I thought she was the au pair for the kids next door. 
uh, she just looks young. Um, <laughs> so we hit it off as friends and we're married six years later or so. But in uh, around the turn of the century, the, the wheels fell off the bus at the restaurants. Cincinnati went through a great upheaval. We were ahead of the curve in terms of the racial issues that the rest of the country has, has had to go through in the last several years. And there was a kid named Timothy Thomas who was shot by the police mm. after a chase, and the city erupted. Uh, there were riots that spring, and then conventions canceled left and right. And 65% of my business was out of towners. Um, there were construction projects derailing traffic. There were layoffs by Procter & Gamble, GE, and General Electric. All these things happened. Oh, wow. And then 9-11 was that September. And my business went from six million bucks to three million bucks in a summer. And I started bleeding, you know, money like crazy. And that was just one restaurant. Um, but that restaurant was the, the centerpiece. And um, I started losing money like crazy and began to put the pieces back together. And in doing so, uh, spent every nickel that I had. And matter of fact, went in the hole by $2 million. And in the summer of 2005, um, I had a creditor call me and say, hey, we're going to sell all your stuff and get our money back. Good luck. And that was on a Friday night. On Saturday night, I had the most marvelous night in the restaurant I think I'd ever had. All the right people were there. Just I was the only one who knew this was the final night. And on Monday morning, I uh, I closed it and... I mean, the restaurant was marvelous. I mean, we had 41 years of consecutive Mobile Travel Guide five-star awards. I mean, it was the most honored and re awarded restaurant in the history of North America. Um, and it'll never be replicated. But I had a ball. So setting that aside, if I hadn't been sober getting through all that, I don't know how I would have been there for my family or the things that then ensued. Huh. Um, so now uh, the, the, all the other restaurants closed. We either sold them or... or um, and I was the only owner of the ones downtown, the ones that went belly up. The rest of them were sold off. Oh, there was more than just Maisonette that you were involved in? Yeah, Maisonette and Lenormandy were downtown. Chester's Roadhouse was in the Burbs. Uh, Bistro Gigi was something we had in another suburb called Marymount. Uh, the Golden Lamb was in Lebanon, Ohio, an old country inn open for 200 years. There was one called Newport Beach, which opened and closed uh, from when I was drinking still, um, was a two barges each the size of a football field floating on the ohio river i know more about welding than i ever wanted to know in my entire life <laughs> trying um, to keep those together and we had nine floods in two and a half years it was just a total disaster no. but um you know in successes and failures that's what it is in the you know restaurant business so um being sober and having sober friends and a sober support system is what really helped me get through all that so now i am broke I had to declare bankruptcy in 2005. So I went from top of the world to bottom of the heap. Hmm. Um, and that $2 million in debt from the business part, was that, I often wonder about this, is it shouldered on you or is it shouldered on some business entity? Like, does that, is that no, taking away your house or a, your personal a, finances or what? How does that go? It was a sub S corporation. It means it's all me. Hmm. So I had to declare personal bankruptcy, I had to get rid of it. Uh, I don't know how your ego works with this, but my bankruptcy was the front page of USA Today. Now, you can say that that's one extreme or the other. That's either bragging or that's terrible, or maybe it's both. I don't know. But that's where I was. What do you say, so, though? Yeah. I think it's a good mix of both, you know? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's quite, yeah. Yeah, my bank, I, front page USA Today, going under. But... Setting that aside, it was my sober relationships that helped me through it. You know, people, so I, here I am after the fact, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I have no clue. Um, uh, a good friend said, hey, you can come down and run uh, a restaurant for, for me for, through the holidays for a couple of, couple of months because I need some extra help. And I did that, but it felt horrible because I went from this shining star of a restaurant um, which at December was just overwhelmingly wonderful to this, this little, you know, this little kind of a nice place where people said, Oh, what are you doing here? Every time they walked in the door, cause everybody knew who I was. So it was very humbling. It was very, but mm -hmm. you know what? I had four kids to feed at the time and I needed some money and I did what I have to do. And then, so 
now it's January and what am I going to do? And a local real estate broker who owns the largest firm in the tri-state area here, Rob Sibsey, he grabs me and he says, you dodo, you know, everybody, you need to sell real estate. And I said, oh my, no, I, I couldn't possibly, you know, I'm too far too important to do something like that. Um, so I'm very lucky to have a good friend named Dick Duvall. And Dick said to me, he said, well, you got a choice. He said, you can save your ass or save your pride, but you don't get to have both. <laughs> so, so it felt I, like a big downgrade to you to, to do the real estate thing. Like why, why yeah, is that? It's just a different career. Like what, why, it's just why is a it a different career? But yeah. my ego talking, I went from somebody who was in, in the public eye. I, I used to say, if I didn't get on the radio once a week or on the TV or on in a newspaper or in a magazine, if I didn't have press once a week, I wasn't doing my job. I needed to continue to promote the restaurants. Now I'm going from this big, important pseudo celebrity to, you know, Sally selling houses. In my mind, I was paying attention to what other people thought about me. Mm. I wasn't worried about what I thought about me. And I realized, you know, I've got a job. I've got four kids. I need to provide for them. I need to take care of what's in front of me right now and not worry about what anybody else thinks. And so I went to work selling houses with the goal that I would eventually sell um, commercial real estate, which I ended up doing. But that first year I made $9,000 and I thought, oh, this is the worst thing I've done in my entire life. In real estate? Ouch. In real yeah. estate. It was terrible. Must have been a bad year too. But, but you had to learn. It's a 2006. Thing. Yeah. The market was crashing. I'm going into it. I went from the top of the world in the restaurant business to the market's crashing and you're going to sell houses. Oh, it was bad. But it pretty quickly turned around for me at least because of that same work ethic and because there's a sense of urgency in the restaurant business that doesn't really exist in the rest of the world. If you go into a restaurant and you sell the waiter or waitress, you know, I'd love a glass of wine. And the waitress says, yeah, give me a half an hour. I'll come back to you. Oh, well, you're not going to, you're not there. You're not there. You're leaving, right? Yeah. So yeah, you're definitely not drinking I, a second glass. No, like, so I'm, the same, <laughs> I'm this that. way in the, in the, um, in the real estate world, um, I tell all of my uh, clients, if it's Saturday at 10 o'clock and you got a question, don't think I shouldn't call him because or text him because it's Saturday at 10 o'clock. I'd rather you get it out of your head and get the answer because it's going to take me two seconds to give you the answer. Mm. So, so, I, so all my people I work with know that. And I provide a level of service, which was just like I did in the restaurants. But again, Thinking clear-headed and being true to who I am was what came from being sober. And if I hadn't been, it was hard that first year. I mean, it was really hard to earn $9,000 after, you know, making a significant, you know, living in days prior. Yeah. And eking through. And now the weird thing is I'm third in the company out of a thousand agents, um, I make a better living than I ever did in the restaurant business, running five restaurants. Yeah. Um, I have a, I actually have a, a second job. I'm designing resort properties with some friends of mine, literally on a global scale from Guam to Portugal. Um, you know, how did I get here? It's just marvelous. I'm very grateful. I'm grateful every day for every piece that's in front of me. My mom always tells a story that's similar to that of you know, struggling for a bunch of years and having, being difficult to make ends meet and then eventually getting to a point where things were easier or like not expecting that success of the future. I don't know if that's like a survivorship bias, you know, I'm talking to people that happen to be more successful in the future or if this is just a general trend that like just keep working at it and things get better for everyone. Well, they do. I mean, it's like, it's like, yeah watching your batting average if you pay attention to it eventually it starts to get better and you learn what it is that you're changing to make it better and along the way i learned what i was doing in the real estate business that wasn't getting me business and you leave those things behind and you pursue the high high payoff activities and and suddenly you're doing rather well yeah and now i'm over scheduled you know I, wah wah <laughs> I have some other friends in the uh, restaurant business that uh, they focus on chains on, you know, uh, and owning a bunch of those or, you know, 10, 20, 30 of a certain chain. And then they seem to do very well with it. Do you think restaurant business is just very cyclical like this? Like it's a 
can you have a straight up curve with it? Or does everybody have this kind of like, it goes well for a while and then uh, eventually the market catches up to you and, and restaurants just fail? I think the average is going to say yes. That, that you know, uh, I think the statistic is out of every five restaurants that opens in the U.S., only two will make it to three years. And of those two that make it to three years, only one will make it to five years. Um, restaurants fail. They're a difficult, difficult business. That said, um, we took over the Golden Lamb in 1969 and then sold our interest in it in 2001. Um, we opened Chester's Roadhouse in 1972 and sold it only because there was a guy who wanted the land for a car dealership. There was no other reason. He kept mm. giving a bigger number in 2007. Um, uh, Maisonette uh, opened in 48 and I closed it in 2005. My grandfather opened La Normandy in 1931 and I closed it in 2005. So definitely bucking the trends. I just happened to be the one that was on the way out. Yeah. And a lot of years of success and making a living and employing people that were making a living, or there's a lot of cash and living generated off of all, for all those years. Right. Or, or how do yeah. you see it as, was that a success or not a success? Oh, it was a huge success. It was a marvelous success. Restaurants are very tribal. They have to be your family because you end up spending more time with them than you actually do spend with your family which is the unfortunate side of the restaurant business. Um, but there's a, I used to talk to my staff about the symbiotic relationship between employee or employee in a restaurant business. And that um, if, we don't, if we don't produce as a whole, then they can't survive as individuals. And neither can I survive as an individual if they don't produce as a whole. It's, it's very in, enmeshed. And let's say you got a plate that... Um, cost you 10 bucks okay just a dinner plate and somebody mm -hmm. breaks that dinner plate well if you sell a hamburger at five bucks the average restaurant in america makes a nickel on the dollar so that hamburger earned 25 cents okay how many hamburgers do i have to sell to make up for the plate you just broke gotta buy it's, some paper just, plates instead at some point yeah. right yeah <laughs> i used to, i used to spend two thousand dollars a week on china glass and silver wow a week. It's an astounding number, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Over a hundred grand a year on China glass and silver. I look at this for a lot of businesses and I don't know how they survive, right? Like how it all adds really up. I, I worked at Intel for a long time and I think of it that way for, so from big businesses like that, where the finances are public and it obviously must be working out. And I know we had a huge finance department that was doing all the math and knows that it's working out, but I would look at the things we do. It, um, at my level, it's like, did I really sell a hundred processors or, you know, like to make the money to go pay for this plane ticket or like, is me doing this trip or this activity worthwhile enough to the company that it's going to move units <laughs> and pay for yeah. itself? And it's always very hard to see those connections. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, uh, um, the restaurant business, I, th I think the, uh, I think I said the average restaurant in America makes a nickel on the dollar and I don't. I don't know how any of them survive, especially you. So you got, you say you have friends that work in chains. Well, chains have a economy of scale because their marketing dollar is shared amongst however many are in that chain. Right. Well, a mom and pop like us, I mean, we've got to carve that dollar out of whatever you're doing. So how many hamburgers do you have to sell to, you know, put an ad on the radio? It's really a hard decision to make a hard juxtaposition between expense and income. Yeah. Yeah. Will yeah. it really get people in the door? I think about that a little bit with this podcast. It's like, should I be running some ads and how much budget do I put against that? And is it worth anything to me? And yeah, it, with a business, it's, it's a real question mark. You, you have a revenue number and you have a percentage, maybe you're willing to spend on marketing and how to, how to spend it efficiently. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't have to do that anymore. I went from 350 employees to one. It was kind of a refreshing change. So, and you know, it was thrust upon me. It wasn't something I chose, but as changes go, it's probably the best way to do it. You know, just being thrown into the cold water. I mm. mean, you got to swim. That's it. So you're working for yourself now that way. You're part of, a, part yeah. of another group um, and don't have to <laughs> support other people that way. That's nice. You must have some assistance. Yeah. The broker provides Brokerage. some secretarial assistance and some administrative, some paperwork, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but I work solo. Uh, there's a lot of 
there's a lot of teams out there. There's a lot of groups out there, but, um, you know, I did an inordinate amount of business last year, just me. And it's because, you know, um, if I work till eight or nine o'clock at night and I started at eight or nine o'clock in the morning, well, that's nothing compared to a restaurant day. It really isn't. Wow. You know, I used to go in at nine and come home at midnight to one. Yeah, it's just, it's, this is a piece of cake. Jeez. Saturday night, I get squirrely sometimes where my wife and I'll sit at home watching a movie or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I got to, I should be doing something. I should be, it's as odd. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that, that's a decent segue to how did you have a family doing that kind of hours and, and yeah. not how'd you make a family? That's not what I mean, but how do you maintain a relationship with your kids and your wife and everything? Yeah. Well, um, the sad part about it is for my oldest two kids, for Courtney and Robin, I really missed a lot of their events. Um, I would go to anything I could. And luckily, in a restaurant, you think about lunch and dinner. If somebody had a soccer game in the afternoon, I could leave work, go to the soccer game, and then go back to work. But you just had to carve out moments where you can participate. Um, but I missed a lot. I just did. Yeah. And then my younger two kids... In 2005, let's see, Riley was born in 92, so she was, she was going to be 13 right after I closed the doors, and Chris was born in 95, so he had just turned 10. So suddenly I had free time in my hands, and I was there for all of their stuff. And then uh, when Bridget and I got together, Maddie and Chris joined us, and uh, you know, I, that was actually marvelous to be able to connect with other people and to be there for the four of them. Uh, and my older kids didn't seem too da badly damaged. Um, they're out there, you know, being productive and they're loving, kind, wonderful people. Yeah. That's probably the, the thing I wonder about the most is that, um, you know, how did I end up with six very wonderful, kind, loving children? Because they are, they really are. They're sweet people. And it's not my responsibility to raise them, nor is it, um, my credit to claim for my, my wife or I, or ex-wife and I, it's just. Whose responsibility became... was it to raise them then? If, if it wasn't. Well, no, ours. no, 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 no. I'm saying the responsibility not to raise them. We have a responsibility to raise them, but we can't claim responsibility for how they turned out. Mm -hmm. I mean, they are who they are. I mean, yeah, we can tweak things along the way or guide them in a certain direction, but I think there's a luck of the draw too. I mean, they are. There's, I got I got six really wonderful people in my life out of it, and it could have gone the other way. It could have gone the other way. I mean, <laughs> and we had our struggles, you know. Um, one of my daughters had a drug and alcohol problem, you know. It passed right down through mm -hmm. me. But out of out of the four kids that are mine, only one of them has shown that tendency, and she kicked it. You know, she did the hard work and she kicked it. And interestingly enough. Um, she got into real estate uh, sometime after I did, and now she's moving to Ithaca, New York. Mm, nice. I know. And it's fine. I can go visit her up there and kick around the old neighborhood, I guess. <laughs> I'm going to try to head back for a reunion soon. I'm looking for, I haven't been there in a uh, number of years. I'm looking forward to uh, just hanging out on campus for a bit. There's a big crew going this year, I think. A bunch of waiters are going. James Pepper is organizing a bunch of guys to go. Yeah, yeah. I'm hoping I, most people I don't know. I don't think. Both, I don't think from the years I was in school, I don't think I'm going to see many people, if any, that will be, be there from my years. But there'll be a bunch of waiters there, and I'm kind of excited and hopeful to meet up with them and just uh, a lot of guys from the 80s and 90s that I you know, didn't go to school with or maybe never met before. But I think yeah. it'll be fun. I think, like you said, we'll, be, we'll know those songs and we'll, we'll have some way to bond. You'll have and, a blast. Yeah. You will. One thing I like to ask about is how we find and develop partnerships or that like none of these tasks you've done. Now you said you're working on your own at the, mm -hmm. the real estate agency, but really you're not working on your own there. And through the past, you've had lots of people that have helped you along the way and different things. So how do you find a good partner? How do you um, develop those relationships to, you know, be able to go forward and do these things uh, to, to the high levels that you have done? I don't know that I can answer that question because I have burned through partners. When I first got into the business, the real estate business, it was 2006. The world was devolving from a real estate perspective. And so I developed a strategy to get listings that were expiring. And it was really successful. 
within 18 months, I had 50 listings, which is just unmanageable. It's so this is crazy. stuff that was sitting on the market for, in, yeah, with and someone else. Sell. And then, yeah. yeah, you pick it up after as the, the savior a little bit. Right. Yeah. So now I got these ugly babies, if you will, that nobody wants. Uh, and I got 50 of them. So um, the powers that be in the, in the brokerage said, you ought to think about a partner. Here's two people that you should work with. And I worked with both of these two young women for a while, but I got frustrated at their um, different commitment than mine. I was in survival mode at that point. Mm. No holds barred. I needed to sell stuff. I had to eat what I killed. Because if I didn't, I didn't eat. One of them drifted off to a different brokerage. One of them decided she didn't want to work that hard. So I got two more. I got a man and a woman who came with me. And the woman didn't have the... She did some things that I thought were inappropriate. And so we parted company. And the guy and I stayed partners for a good six years, maybe five years. But then he got a broker's license and he moved on. But he and I worked very differently. I have to have neat, organized stacks of things. I have to know where everything is. I have to you know, be able to, at a moment's notice, get what the information I need. He had piles of stuff all over his desk. Yeah. He, he just, you know, and if I needed something from his desk, I had to go over there and start sorting through it and I couldn't find it. It was, I, it just drove me nuts. And I would tell him about it. He would, he, if he listens to this, he will laugh. Um, but so when he left to become a broker and open up his own shop, I thought, I just need to go on my own. Hmm. And I've been doing that for a while. Now, six months ago, a young lady came into the office named Lauren and Lauren, um, I saw her working like the Dickens and she has three kids. And she's always buzzing around. She's always answering phone calls. And I asked her to do something for me. And she did it. And she did it quickly. And she, did, she didn't ask questions. She just did it. So I started feeding more to her. And so I wouldn't say we're partners at this point. But I lean on her on a regular basis. Like when I had uh, my gallbladder out last September. And I was down for a good 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, she just picked up the, the reins. She just did everything that I would do. And she didn't ask and she didn't complain and she sacrificed time with her kids. And I thought, hmm, there's somebody who kind of works like me. <laughs> so I, I don't know if it's, um, if I have a workaholism problem, maybe I do, I don't know. But um, it's hard for me to find somebody who I can lean on like that because I'm just, I'm just obsessed with getting things done. At that moment, it's been requested. If it, if it lingers too long, the opportunity is lost. Yeah. Yeah. You mentioned her missing time with her kids. And, and before you were talking about with your older two kids, you, mm -hmm. you felt like you weren't there as, as often or, or also missed some time that way. Do you have any stories or any particular time that like looking back, um, you wish you'd done something different there? I don't know if I have stories necessarily because the stories imply an event and I wasn't there. I was having a great time in the restaurant business. I mean, that's the other thing too, is it can be a lot of fun. So I wasn't like I was sitting around pining to be with my kids. Oh, you were living your own life and doing... Yeah, living my own life, yeah. whether it was sporting events or... And you know, now that I think about it, I went to every father-daughter dance that I could possibly go to. I think there was one father-daughter dance with Courtney we went to and after it was over, we went down and had dinner at the restaurant so I could buzz around the restaurant and check in on things. So they were incorporated. When I was a kid, my parents thought the wisdom was, you're working all summer starting 13. And then some weekends during the school year, if we need something, because that's what the restaurant family does. Mm -hmm. So like someone is out sick or whatever, and we need another helping hand, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah. There's no yeah. bus boy in the Normandy tonight. You're coming downtown with me, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so when I was 13, I was bussing tables, but when I was 16, the summer of my 16th year, I'm driving. So, you know, this is it. I'm going to be dating. I'm going to be, I'm going to be having a ball. I'm going to be driving to friends' houses, going to parties. So this is my summer when I'm 16, I go to work at like eight in the morning. And the first thing I'd do is I'd slice 150 pounds of onions. Then I would puree garlic for Caesar salad. 
then I'd puree anchovies for the Caesar salad. Then I'd make garlic butter, and then I'd stuff snails with garlic butter. Then I'd clean fish the rest of the day. And then you had no there dates. Was no, yeah, yeah. There was no <laughs> way. There were no dates. There was no way to get the smell out. It was just in my clothes, in, under my nails, in my skin, in my hair. I mean, they're just, and, you know, my mother would joke about the fact that my sheets, my room just smelled horrid for that entire summer. So, yeah. But my point was... Um, I did not do that to my kids. They all got the chance to come to the restaurant and work, but just to experience work and being around people and being around me. And I'd bring my son or daughter in and, you know, they'd work in the kitchen and, and, and they had more fun, you know, and they'd work a couple, three days a week for maybe two or three weeks. And then that was it. <laughs> yeah. Their summers were very different than mine. So but I tried to bring the kids in as much as I could, and I would encourage my uh, wife at the time to bring them in and have dinner with me. You know, even you know, whatever it is, you sit down at six o'clock and have dinner in the restaurants, and somebody serves you, and it's you find a way to make them mesh. But I missed so many, just little things, just you know, so many bedtimes, so many story times, whatever it was. Yeah. One thing I wonder about with your kids then is. Uh is like how you feel success in your own life and how you see it in theirs or whether, so maybe start off with, with your, your own self. You've gone through a lot of stories of, of success over your past. What do you see for your, your future or what are your goals as you move on from this, this time? It's funny. I used to think I would retire when I was 50. Yeah. That's not going to happen. <laughs> not when you go bankrupt at 48, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but I don't know that I am the kind of person that really can retire anyway. I think I just need to, to keep myself a purpose. Golf is not a purpose. I'm not a golfer. Watching television is not a purpose. I need a purpose to get me through my days and keep me moving in a forward direction. So success for me is to continue to not be a burden on others, to provide for my family. The bank of dad is still wide open, you know, even though they're all grown. It's, it's just the way it works. So, but success in my children, I define it a lot more by their happiness. And my son, Robin, is my best example of that, in that he went to Oberlin and he had a dual major in Mandarin and economics. And we have some relatives who work in the financial sector, and one of them was the chairman of the Asian division of Morgan Stanley. And I thought to myself, well, I, I know what this is, this Robin's doing. Robin's just going to follow Jack. And good for him. What a marvelous way to, you know, pursue a career, to emulate somebody that successful. So Robin got out of Oberlin, and he got a job in Georgetown in the financial sector. And three months in, he gives me a call. And he says, um, Dad, I hate this. Now, I think he means I hate this particular job in Georgetown. Mm. And I'm going, that's okay, bud. It's all right. You know, this is why, you know, you, you got a good education, and you can apply for something else, and you, you know, you start looking around and he said, no, dad, I hate the whole notion of the financial world. Oh, it's really tough to figure one. that out too. I mean, I it, applaud him yeah. for just after three months having that revelation and being like, I don't like doing this and, and like strength in it. Well, the ink wasn't dry on the tuition checks yet. I yeah. mean, it was. And so I said, so what do you want to do? He said, I want to teach myself how to make movies. And I said, how much money do you have? He said, $1,200. And I said, I love you and good luck. Because at that time, I had made $9,000 in that year. I was <laughs> yeah, totally nothing broke. to add to this 1200 Nothing to add to that. So he did yeah. it. So he goes to New York. He goes to Brooklyn and New York. He couch surfers for, surfs for, on friends' couches for a while. Um, he gets an internship at a directing studio. He actually gets a directorship after a few years. He starts making television commercials. He starts writing screenplays. He produces two short films that won at the Portland and Toronto Film Festivals, as well as a few others. Um, the scripts get a lot of attention to Hollywood, and now he's in the middle of being greenlit to write his own movie and direct it. And it's going to be about his sister's journey through drug addiction hmm. based on a Red Lobster commercial in the 80s. I know that sounds weird. <laughs> But it's really cool. This was your random text generator uh, creating this this idea. It, it sounds like no, but... I'm not. No, it really wasn't. It was very, very cool. It's um, 
it's like a Groundhog Day, but this is a Red Lobster commercial. But every time the commercial plays, it degrades a little bit <laughs> and it gets weirder and weirder. And then she has to fight her way out of this and then find her way to and it's it's a fascinating it's a fascinating piece. Anyway, very cool. Not only that, yeah, good luck uh, to him. he's newly married and he's blissfully happy because he's doing something that he wants to do. I mean, I, I got in the restaurant business because that was what was expected of me. And don't get me wrong. I had an absolute ball. But I don't know that I wouldn't have been a doctor or an architect or something more mathematical because that's where my strengths are. Music and math are a great correlation. But I was pretty damn good at the restaurant business. So my success in my kids, it's seeing them happy. My middle daughter, mm -hmm. Riley, hated high school. I'm not going to do it. So she ended up going to a trade school, uh, as a cooking school, thinks she, she's going to get in the family business. And she hated it too. But Riley is an incredibly talented singer and musician. I mean, she's really talented. Hmm. So now that's what she does. And she married a guy who's a musician, and he's incredibly talented. Go out and dial up Soul Criminal, and you'll go, wow, that's really cool. Oh, awesome. It's, it's just this, you know, this jazz funk combo, kind of like Hiati, Hiatus Coyote or something like that. But they're trying to make a mark on the world. Sounds cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll link them in the description here. We'll... We'll there you go. Okay. And then there's uh, Chris, my uh, youngest son, um, who decided that he liked electronic music and he started composing tunes when he was 15. He had a BMI account when he was 15 because there were people buying his music to lay down rap tracks over it. And now he's out at Electric Forest or Soundgarden or the Uns Festival being a DJ in front of 20,000 people. Wow. So your whole, a lot of your family has. Yeah. Touched off on things that you that, that are part of your core DNA too. There, the music yeah. and restaurants. Courtney plays guitar and sings. Uh, Maddie worked for a um, for a uh, company in LA that promoted music festivals for a while. Everybody was dabbling in the business. Hmm. Very cool. Yeah, cool. it's a business that is under some turmoil now. That's maybe my last question I'll ask you about here. Is uh, I like to ask everybody about AI and how it's impacting them and their particular kind of field. So how do you see, maybe not on the music front, but maybe on the real estate front, or how do you see the new, you know, large language models and just general tools, both uh, improving or destroying the real estate industry? There have been cries that the sky is falling in the real estate industry since the internet really came, came to being, and it hasn't happened yet. Uh, there's definitely been an improvement in the industry because in the old days the if you were in the business, you, you farmed a neighborhood, uh, and that's what you did to survive. You knew everybody, you were in the local country club or garden club or book club or whatever. You made friends with that school group, the PTA, and you knew that neighborhood. So if somebody wanted to buy in that neighborhood, they had to come to you. Then the internet arrived. And none of that mattered anymore. Mm. So now someone like me who has the strength of contact capital everywhere within 50 miles of Cincinnati, I literally work within 50 miles of Cincinnati. I've sold them in Lexington. I've sold them in Dayton because I have customers that used to come from there. So, mm. it, so that works for me. But there's still this, this, this looming thread that, you know, it's the sky is falling. It's coming whether it's AI or some other form of automation. And I don't think it's really at the end of the day possible because what you don't have in that automation is somebody you can lean on who can help you make a decision, which is monumental. It's the largest investment any couple or individual will probably make in their lifetime. Yeah. When they buy a house. Yeah. It's a big number. Yeah, and you can be an analyst and you can sit there and be a, a real number cruncher. And at the end of the day, there's an emotional component which you've got to get over and you need someone to help you over that hurdle. And much like the restaurant business, there are so many corollaries in, from the restaurants to real estate. And um, I could go on for days, but one of the coolest things, when I was a 15-year-old, 14, 15-year-old kid bussing tables, there were waitresses in Lenormandy and remember, this is 1972, 73. There were waitresses there making five to $800 a night by serving 
five dollar steaks. Wow. Because that's what it was back then. It was five dollars. I know dinner tab might be ten dollars with a couple of drinks. Wow. And so that's whatever. a huge, huge tip. Uh, you know, huge amount of money to make oh, uh, as a waitress. Yeah. yeah. But they were they were busy. They were busy until from five o'clock until midnight mm -hmm. back in the day before the restaurant proliferation of the eighties. In the seventies, a good restaurant just cranked. Just slammed. It. Okay. Yeah. So so these ladies, they taught me both directly and indirectly just by watching them. The hostess was never allowed to say, would you like to come with me? Because that's a question. And asking these people who have worked all day long to come in and make another decision at any level was not the way you took care of people. You took care of people by assuming and providing comfort and direction. Come on in, <laughs> you know, have a seat. Don't say, don't say, how's this? Have a seat and enjoy yourself is what the hostess was told to say. The waitress would walk over. And the waitress would walk up to the table, and these were 40, 50-year-old women, 30, 40, 50-year-old women, and they'd come to you and they'd say, you can have a vodka and tonic or a glass of wine tonight. And they'd nod their head just like that. And the customer, nodding his head back, would say, wow, a vodka and tonic. I haven't thought of it. Sure, I'll have a vodka and tonic. <laughs> and before he was finished, she'd say, are you a Stoli or a Smirnoff drinker? There was even, there were, the question of a well vodka wasn't even there. What upgrade are you going to choose? Yeah. Wow. A Stoli is a new thing on the market. I think I'll try that. That's very, thank you very much. And, and they just started telling people what to do. They didn't do it in a way that was bossy or that was impertinent. And it was definitely was something that was caring, it, but they listened to the guest and they allowed them to, to give away the ability to decide to the waiter or waitress. The waiter or wait, the wait, the waitress knew that they, they wanted to have a nice dinner. So they just took over. Yeah. In the real estate, it's the same way. Somebody comes in and they say, I got this house. It's $10,000 above my comfort level. I don't know if I should do this or not. And my response is going to be every thousand dollars you buy, you borrow in this market is going to cost you six bucks, six bucks. So you're by, by uh, buying a $10,000 more expensive house. It's going to be $60 a month. Now is your family's quality of life worth $60 a month. And it just allowed them to make a decision. And that comes from waitresses when I was 14, 15 years old. Yeah. 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 Providing that right info at the right time. There's still some value it's there. It's not just the info. It's it, it, providing them the permission to decide. I mean, we, we, we are fearful beings when it comes to doing something. Uh, we are risk averse when it comes to making large decisions. So someone has to provide you the permission to decide. AI can't provide you that permission to decide. Hmm. You're not going to look that computer in the eye and say, what do you think? And that, you can't take that away. Yeah. There's a thing that happens we, like when people are buying cars and other big purchases too of like analysis paralysis or that you can be hmm. overwhelmed with information. And some studies have been done on that of like, uh, if it's, seven or less characteristics you can compare it but once you start getting more than that and you might think oh this right. is great i need i know all these stats about the car i know it's uh you know how how much how big the engine is and i know how many doors have uh automatic windows yeah. on them and I, I, they just keep adding more and more stats to the list uh and you trying to compare those across models as soon as you get to more than seven it becomes impossible and we get worse at it and you get to it's just stuck. You can't make a good decision or what would be like the ideal decision for you. Right. And so that's a big piece is like, yeah, as we keep providing more information or you can use tools to get more, it, it can potentially hinder your decision making. And, and the real estate agent might be the useful piece popping in there to, to simplify yep. it down to the choice you can make. And you have to, and I have to also be genuine uh, and ethical. And if I see them making a wrong decision, I have to be able to say, you shouldn't do this. And I do. And, mm -hmm. and that engenders a loyalty, which I don't think you're going to find with some automated process, with just an online information delivery, or if that makes sense. Yeah. I think it's going to be an exciting few years. Uh, oh, next few years here doubt. to see <laughs> how, how things change. So. Well, it's yeah. been great talking to you, Nat. I really appreciate you spending the time with me and uh, it's great hearing your stories and, and learning more about you. So, Hey, I'm really uh, happy to be here and I hope this takes off like a rocket for you.
appreciate it. Hundred more, uh, hundred more subscriptions just All from right. this. All right, let's hope. Let's get them up there. <laughs> yeah, like and subscribe, share. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Ian. All right, talk soon. That's it for today. Thanks a ton for listening, and don't forget to like and subscribe. I hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time, friends.